Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Stacy Potter, and I'm a community manager here at WeWorks. It's great to see everyone in the chat. And uh, do let us know where you hail from and what problems you're trying to solve with GitOps and Helm uh, in the chat. Hopefully you're here today here from my colleagues, uh, Scott Rigby, developer experience engineer uh, here at WeWorks, who will be walking you through GitOps and Flux for Helm users. If you're brand new to our various WeWorks or GitOps talks or this series, uh, welcome. And if you've been coming to these sessions for a while, welcome back. So a little bit of background, if this is your first time coming to one of these events. Um, we've been running these for, gosh, since I started here three years ago. Um, and if you haven't heard of us, Scott and I work for a company called WeWorks. Um, we're a startup. Uh, with a globally distributed and remote workforce across the globe. Uh, a lot of what we do is based on open source. You might have heard of us from our projects Flux and Flagger, which are in the CNCF as incubating projects. And we've recently submitted our application to graduate. Um, Flux was also the project that really kicked off the term GitOps. And it's really been uh, cool to see lots of adopters of the project and see the community grow over the last few years. So much so that large organizations and cloud vendors like Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, VMware, and others uh, have adopted it and are using it under the hood to offer GitOps to their customers. Um, Cortex is another one of our projects that is in the CNCF that helps make Prometheus scalable. I mentioned that because Prometheus is a key part of the progressive delivery possibilities with Flagger. And of course, other projects like We've Ignite, EKS Cuddle, and now We've GitOps, which is also a free open source tool that provides GitOps for your various needs and has a UI built on top of Flux. Um, we also have many more than listed here. If you're interested, definitely check us out on GitHub under WeWorks, as well as the CNCF, where you can find our projects. And of course, we're a company that has paid products uh, and services like Flux Support. So if you're interested in learning more about the any of that, please check out the website at weave.works, or you can reach out to me or Scott directly. So a little bit of housekeeping, uh, uh, we have bookmarked a total of an hour for today's session. It may be shorter than that, uh, but we'll stop at the, at the top of the hour. And I don't have to explain Zoom, I'm sure, to most of you. Um, but the one thing that I will say is that we're going to take questions through um, the chat function. So if you can just make sure to change your to uh, when you type in anything there to everyone, uh, that way the audience members can see. A lot of time we have folks banter or answer questions even in the chat. So um, with that, I uh, want to share a little bit of information on how you can get connected to us and the Flux community. So you can visit uh, fluxcd.io to learn more about the project. And if you make your way over to GitHub, you can give us a star there and check out the discussions and the Q&A there as well. Uh, the Flux team, of course, is also on the CNCF Slack under the Flux channel. And if you need an invite, I'll drop all of these links into the chat in just a bit. So we have a bunch more talks coming up uh, for this spring session. Uh, next week, GitOps with Flux on AKS with Kingdon is, uh, is happening. And then Scott will actually be back with uh, our colleague Pinky uh, to talk about GitOps core concepts and ways of structuring your repos. So definitely tune in for that one. And if you're interested in doing stuff around Terraform, we'll have our uh, another colleague, Jose, back to talk about uh, the new Terraform controller, give you a pre preview of that. So, and don't forget to uh, check us out at KubeCon. We'll have a Flux booth there and uh, join us at GitOps Days, which is gonna be happening in June this year. So uh, with that, Scott, I am done and I will turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Stacey. Um, yeah, so, so uh, as Stacey mentioned, I'm Scott Rigby. Hi, nice to meet you all. Um, I uh, I am on the as they said I'm on the Dev Experience team at WeWorks. Um, I'm involved in a bunch of different uh, open source things and CNCF things, including I co-chair the GitOps the CNCF GitOps Working Group. Um, I co-maintain some CNCF projects, uh, including Helm Flux and Open GitOps, um, which is a, a standardization across uh, various uh, projects that are related to GitOps. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I'm gonna give this talk on, on using Flux to implement GitOps for Helm users. 
Um, so that Twitter handle there, R6BY, that's me. Uh, feel free to, you know, ping me. Um, I suppose slide into my DMs, but yeah, just feel free to reach out to me <laughs> anytime. Um, and about open source projects uh, there, or you know, CNCF Slack or uh, other Slacks. So uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna quickly uh, right after this little agenda slide, I'm gonna go over um, who the intended audience for this talk is, so that you know you're in the right place. Uh, I assume you probably are, but you know, just just to help level set. Um, the second is a real level set uh, where we're gonna briefly introduce, I'm going to briefly introduce Helm, GitOps and Flux for newcomers, just what those are. Um, but we'll keep that pretty short. And then I'll explain some of the benefits of Flux specifically for Helm users. Um, uh, talk about the journey from, man briefly talk about the journey from managing Helm uh, using the Helm CLI um, to managing Helm with GitOps using the Helm controller. And finally, um, you know, then I'll just show you that with this demo, which will be the second uh, half of this. And I'll be able to show you different cool things, I think, um, and we'll save some time for Q&A at the end. So yeah, um, this talk is for Helm users, uh, all Helm users. You might be using the, probably are using the Helm uh, uh, client or the CLI by hand um, and or in CI automation in your continuous integration. Um, you may be just getting started with Helm. Uh, so, you know, you might've just downloaded it today <laughs> uh, uh, or you may have been using it for years. So however long um, you've been using it, this talk is definitely for you. Uh, so I am, um, uh, I guess I won't spend more time on this about how to get involved with Helm because we have a weekly Helm talk and we have, um, uh, information on how to get involved with the Helm community on Helm.sh. This is really just about how to um, how to do uh, GitOps um, for Helm. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to your questions after um, this talk. And I think, as Stacy said, just make sure to send those in in Zoom, and we'll get to them. And if there are too many, you know, we can follow up with you afterwards. But I'm going to save a good amount of time. So. Um, so yes, yeah, so for, for the new users for just a moment, you're probably watching this because you have some interest or at least curiosity uh, in GitOps and Flux, but I won't any, assume any specific knowledge about any of that um, uh, or Helm. So we'll start with a really short intro, um, just to be welcoming to everybody. So Helm is a widely adopted package manager for finding, sharing, and deploying apps on Kubernetes. Um, in the context of Helm, you're going to hear terms like charts, releases, and revisions. Um, and here's a very short explanation without getting too into it for those who, uh, so everybody can really follow along. Uh, so basically, similar to apt or yum for Linux, Helm manages packages for Kubernetes called charts. That's what the names of the packages are. Uh, they can, a chart contains a set of related Kubernetes resource definitions for applications, which can be deployed to a cluster, along with your, generally along with your user specified configurations, if you wish, for how that application is supposed to behave. So the deployed Kubernetes objects and user defined configuration values are called together releases. So when you release an app, that's what we mean by release, the actual running application and all those resources plus your configs. So those releases in Helm have revisions that you can then roll back to if you need, say you make a change in the configuration and you don't like it, uh, roll back um, and, and that helps you out there. So Helm charts exist for most applications that can be run on Kubernetes and there are about 7,000 charts to choose from on CNCF Artifact Hub. So um, uh, have fun with that. It, it, there, it, there's really a lot there and um, the most popular ones are, are easier to find. Um, so really your, your needs should usually be. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, that's a very brief intro to what Helm is and then what is Helm scope? Um, 
this does lead into the GitOps thing. So be patient here for a second. Uh, it's actually pretty good to know, even if you do know about Helm. So in order to guide you through the benefits that that GitOps and, and Flux brings to Helm, I'm going to briefly note um, just what is in an app scope. So in short, Helm is now Helm is a client and an SDK only. So this was by design when Helm moved from Helm 2 to Helm 3. Um, there's, there's no agent running on the cluster. Uh, there's, um, uh, so I would say it in general in scope, um, uh, Helm provides the SDK for other tools to make best use of its internal functionality and, and also the, the CLI uses it too. So um, here are some things that are designed to be out of scope. I'm just gonna read that piece. Um, CRD upgrades are designed to be out of scope. Helm doesn't manage that for very specific reasons. And we have some, uh, we have uh, doc, some docs pages uh, dedicated just to this. Um, Helm is not aware in itself of, of multiple environments. So it, you need to use other tools for this. Uh, for example, a lot of people, when they first start using Helm, use either a, a Helm file for, for this because it really features this heavily. Um, or let's say a bash make file, something like this um, in their automation. Helm also doesn't have anything uh, related to control loop functionality or anything, any retry logic outside of the basic um, under the hood uh, client commands. And that's because it's a client. So uh, it's supposed to be um, attended or you can rerun the thing in automation if you want to use the client itself. Um, there's also no What's specifically outside of Helm are any automated responses apart from rollback if you set those options when you make a deployment. And uh, there's also no um, drift detection. So um, there is a Helm diff plugin, and you can imperatively run that to show some, some diffs, but there's no automated drift detection. Um, so there's no self repairing there. Um, you're, when you're using the Helm client, you're intended to, to build, use other tools for that. So uh, now I'm gonna jump into GitOps uh, briefly, just what it is. Um, you, uh, in short, it's a set of principles for operating, operating and managing software systems. Um, the principles are derived from modern software operations, but they're also rooted in pre-existing and widely adopted best practices. So uh, this isn't just coming from nowhere. Um, and we're giving credit, everybody's giving credit where credit is due here. Uh, in short, the principles are these four things, that the desired state of a GitOps managed system, which is ultimately what you want to happen, uh, or what you want to happen, not just not telling it how you want it to happen. Um, the desired state must be declarative. Um, it, uh, you've gotta be able to, for all of your applications, be able to say, this is what I want my end state to be. Um, Kubernetes core, uh, uh, objects have this by design. It's one of the three deployment strategies you can use. Um, it's one most most used for most uh, recommended for production, but it is uh, it's a very popular way to do this. So um, that's important. If you're going to use Helm, you have to be able to have a way to declare those Helm releases uh, to the Kube API, which Helm does not have built in by itself. Uh, the second um, the second GitOps principle is that your desired state must be versioned and immutable. So the easy way to do this is, is put it in Git and configure Git properly. Um, it doesn't have to be Git. Uh, it could be any system that is versioned and immutable that follows um, the principle itself. Um, so check that out and join the GitOps working group if you're interested in other, other uh, types of, of versionable um, uh, systems that can have the releases be immutable. For example, um, S3 compatible storage buckets or other types of storage buckets, um, OCI uh, registries, etc. cetera. Um, and then the th third principle is that uh, your desired state must be pulled automatically. That's super important. Um, and, then the, uh, and then ultimately, um, once that information is pulled into your cluster automatically, software agents are continuously running 
on your system to continuously reconcile your, de your declared uh, ideal end state um, to make sure that that gap between that and reality or the actual state is as close to zero as possible or it continues to get close to zero. Um, yeah, so, so um, <clears throat> I think I'd mentioned the declarative management. Uh, the, the system basically, once that's declared, the system works to make your declarations a reality and usually reports the status of progress making the uh, intending to make that declared state a reality. So over time, the system, um, you know, reality might change without um, uh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, there, there are, uh, what I meant by drift, I think I just wanted to say is that there are times where your system might change for a reason that's not because you specified that you want to change. Something could go wrong in the cluster. Um, a bad actor could get in there. Um, a good actor um, might accidentally be working on a production cluster instead of, instead of a development cluster, et cetera. And so those are all reasons why you want that continuous reconciliation. So um, in, I'll be a little bit short about this, but I just wanna be super clear about, about why these principles matter. Principle one is very similar to infrastructure as code, um, except that it applies to apps as well as infrastructure. Principle two is where the Git part of GitOps as a name comes from. Uh, but like I said, any other system that fits this criteria defined by the principle can be used. Um, and then principle three pulled automatically is what differentiates GitOps from event-driven CI jobs triggered by changes in Git. So you don't have to do an event like say push a commit or make anything specific to happen in order for that for that reconciliation to happen. It, it happens on its own. Um, and principle four is 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 the is that those software agents are always assessing the actual system state um, to bring it closer to your desired state. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then um, really Flux uh, is a CNCF incubating project and the Flux family of projects, this slide shows um, how uh, there are different pieces of it. it. It is a set of continuous and progressive delivery solutions from Git to Kubernetes. So it includes the Flux CLI, the GitOps toolkit, which is a set of controllers and Go packages that make this work within your cluster, uh, and Flagger, which is a progressive delivery tool built to work with GitOps. So remember those things I said, Helm doesn't do by design. This is where Flux picks up, uh, at least within the realm of GitOps, where the scope of Helm leaves off. So Helm is the packaging and release tool. Flux allows for collaborative, declarative, and automated management of complex environments. Um, let's see here. Uh, Oh, uh, I, I wanted to mention uh, a few really important things here. So um, Flux uh, is, as far as I know still, the only CD continuous delivery tool that purely uses Helm's SDK uh, without forking Helm to do it. Um, it allows Flux to do really powerful things while maintaining solid architecture and also a low memory footprint in your cluster. Um, and because we're at big SDK users, it means we contribute to Helm upstream. So everyone gets the benefits, not only Flux. So, you know, um, why we use, one of the main reasons we use open source, right? Uh, other big benefits are Flux's Helm controller manages CRD upgrades. I'm super excited by this. Um, uh, and if you're a heavy Helm user, you know that this is a really important feature. Um, uh, the Helm controller also uses, uh, it includes the depends on feature, and that's really important because it allows you to manage a tree of chart dependencies without having to ma make big umbrella charts um, or, or progressive levels of big umbrella charts for, for, uh, for deploying things and for deploying charts releases in order. Um, and I think as, as folks who are doing this not on their in any environment besides their local computer, no, 
Um, that can take kind of a big memory footprint when using the CLI to do that because it loads all of those charts into memory at once. So it depends on, helps with that and allows your agents to run using a much smaller memory footprint. Um, a few other really big features are, it's built on controller runtime, the Flux Helm controller. So um, it includes control loop and retry logic out of the box, the same controller runtime that core Kubernetes um, reconcilers use. Uh, it's also valuable uh, so that that's a valuable thing to note because if you, whether or not you're a Helm user and whether or not you've ever considered contributing to controllers like the Flux Helm controller, if you are aware of Kubernetes controller runtime, contributing will be much easier. And if you're not yet, and you begin to contribute to the Flux Helm controller, uh, that knowledge will not just be completely siloed. It is applicable to all of the other um, Kube Builder uh, controllers. So um, Flux also gives you feedback on how automating your Helm releases is going through Flux notification controller. And it does include the drift detection that I mentioned is not part of uh, the scope of Helm. So, um, okay. So there are a few more things to know about Flux in general. I'm not gonna go uh, over these, they are on fluxcd.io. There's a lot to talk about here and I wanna get to the demo. So um, uh, so I just, I'm just gonna mention briefly, so you know that these are the case. Uh, this is, these are some things people don't know that uh, I've mentioned that Flux provides GitOps both for apps and infrastructure. It's not just M4S code. Um, <clears throat> in general, you push to flop, you push to Git and that's all you should have to do. You shouldn't really have to interact with your cluster um, directly, uh, except for incident management and other times when it's required. Um, Flux generally works with your existing tools. It works with all major Git providers, um, all container registries, CI workflow providers. Um, it works with any Kubernetes um, uh, and all com common Kubernetes tooling um, in the sense that it uses our back under the hood. It doesn't have a separate um, access uh, control system or anything like that. Um, it works with customized Helm and ultimately other tools that you use already. Um, it does multi-tenancy and uh, we say multi-everything because there's also multi-cluster options and other um, using CAPI um, and, other, um, and other good things. So I think the other pieces I mentioned and that's just important to note. So I hope that wasn't super boring. Uh, yeah, so, so in short, um, just to give you like a very quick overview of the controllers, I won't really dive into them. I'll just let you know that it is a set of controllers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's not just one big thing running in your cluster and they can, be, they can run independently, some of them. Um, but if you, the most common Flux installation is the source controller on which most things depend. Uh, source controller watches your defined sources where you specify your desired state that I mentioned before, and it it, it brings those changes and, and excuse me and brings any changes that you make in your source, like say in Git or your S3 bucket or whatever you specify as your source, um, into your cluster so that other controllers can act on them. Um, and the desired state can be in a variety of formats. That can be plain YAML, customized overlays, or Helm charts. I'm just taking a quick look at the chat to see if there are any big questions so far. Okay, um, moving along then the customized controller, um, that really, it gets your changes from the source controller and tries to apply uh, both plain YAML and um, optionally customized overlays. So um, we, jet, we don't have a plain YAML controller separate from customized controller because customize uh, that's now part of kube control essentially wraps kube control apply. So we didn't need to build another one because, it, because in giving this functionality, it also does plain YAML. Um, this is important to note in thinking about the architecture because the other custom resource def, uh, custom resources that the, the, the other controllers define and um, that you create in order to run Flux per, uh, in order to be able to, to set your Helm releases declaratively, uh, to write them declaratively, I mean, and to tell uh, Flux what you want it to do automatically through GitOps, um, 
those custom resources are read into the system and brought into the Cube API by the customized controller because they're plain YAML. Um, and uh, yeah, so so um, so the Helm the Helm controller will manage your Helm releases for you based on the information. The notification controller will let you know when things go wrong or when when there's anything important that you need to know. Um, and then the image reflector and automation controller, um, the image automation controllers handle writing exact image versions back to your Git source if your desired state is a Simber range or cons range constraint. So this is basically provides pinning for GitOps um, for when you need to, for when you want to scale up or during disaster recovery. So you can get back to the exact version that you had. Um, okay, so let's just look at a quick architecture diagram so you can see how they work to manage Helm releases, because that's what this talk is about. Um, uh, when running Flux Bootstrap, um, which is the optional, the easiest way, and I'll show you, uh, this, it installs the Flux components in your cluster, um, mirrors those manifests in your Git repo, it imperatively adds custom resources telling source controller that I just mentioned to watch your Git repo and it makes sure to mirror, uh, excuse me, and it makes sure to mirror those manifests in your repo. Uh, so from this, from that point on, uh, the customized controller periodically works to reconcile these manifests with the resources running in your controller. The source controller is looking at them, the customized controller is saying, okay, cool, you made a chance to change to your manifest, we're going to throw that in the Kube API. The other controllers are listening to the Kube API and they are, uh, then they will do what they need to do. So for example, you can edit those files directly in your cluster if you wanted to, um, uh, but, um, but you don't have to at that point because you, you can edit the files in your in Git and you'll be doing GitOps at that point. You won't really need to interact with the cluster directly any longer. Um, yeah, in, in general, what Helm controller does for you, hopefully this gives you a little bit of a sense now um, for those who didn't know the architecture, that it syncs Helm repo and Helm release custom resources to the Kube API uh, uh, and uses Helm SDK to do all the Helm things that you're already used to doing using the CLI, the Helm CLI. So uh, I'm going to just mention this, but I won't get too into it because I want to actually show you in demo form. But um, I hope it's clear at this point that that for folks that want to take the journey from at least in production or, or, or whatever, wherever you think GitOps makes sense for you, from using the Helm CLI primarily to using the Helm controller is you have to make sure that your, um, your Helm uh, releases, repo info, and so on is, is declaratively um, defined. So for, for CI automation, Users, if you're, um, if you mainly use, you know, if you've got jobs in CI like GitHub Actions or Jenkins or or something else, and that that's calling um, the Helm CLI to do what you need to do to do what you want Helm to do automatically for you. The most important piece of this is a process of decoupling your your continuous integration from your continuous delivery. Um, and we've got talks that are that are really just on that. Um, uh, Kingdom has done some really good talks uh, about, and there's a whole section in the docs about about really how to do that with various CI tools and how how Flux can uh, connect to those, and it all starts with that decoupling process. Um, so, and for any Helm user, um, when you're using Flux, your Helm releases are already properly separated in continuous into continuous delivery, so you don't really have to worry about that. And then this last note on here is just that. You know, this is probably not uh, big news to you all because you, you know that change is necessary, but change for organizations and change for a lot of folks can be very frightening. So um, there are various uh, tips that might help that I'm not going to go over now, but um, but they're in the slide and, and please check it out. We'll share with you the link to the slide afterwards. Um, so, uh, you know, just just diff there's different things that we can help provide you. Um, through the GitOps user group, through the Weave org user group, and um, 
uh, success stories, different different tips uh, on how to actually show um, uh, how this implement how this implementation can work, and you know how it's um, uh, nothing to be afraid of for those folks who are. Okay, so this is more like a preview of of the demo, um, and just more about the benefits, some of the use cases that you might be looking for. Um, when you're using the Helm controller on an existing cluster, uh, or sorry, one of <laughs> one of the use cases is using the Helm, installing the Helm controller on an existing cluster, which can allow you to to uh, to do a kind of lift and shift or a pivot to GitOps um, bit by bit. Um, uh, it can also um, allow you to migrate onto fresh infrastructure, um, and there are a few different nice ways to do that, and they don't look that that dissimilar. I'll show you in the demo real quick. Um, and you can, uh, the nice thing is you can also mix and match um, both custom Helm charts for your internal, you know, your internal applications as needed and shared internal or community Helm charts. Um, it's all uh, just the way you would normally do it using Helm, but you can do this uh, step by step. Um, and as your journey, as your journey makes you ready to do. So um, uh, I was gonna go over configuring Flux to own your existing releases, but I, I think I wanna, I think I want to just mention that you can do this. And I will show you in the demo exactly how to do this, but take a look back at this slide um, when you uh, when you want to try this at home and follow along. So uh, same with this common pitfall slide. There is some, this is a bit of a wall of text here, but I wanted to try to stuff in some, some, uh, some information about common pitfalls. That's, um, and again, take a look at the slide, read it, uh, come back with to the Q&A at the end here, and also um, you know, contact me or others on, uh, on Twitter, Slack, et cetera. Because uh, there are known uh, issues that folks run into that really aren't that difficult to overcome if you know what to do. Okay, great. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to show you this demo from a gist that I made. Um, I'm going to sh share again so I can show you my the gist plus my terminal at the same time. Can you all hear me okay? Stacy, is, is this coming yeah. through? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. There's been a couple of very small blips, but no biggie. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, just give me one second here. Okay. I will share my full screen now. Great. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead uh, just to get started. Uh, I show you how you can. <laughs> there are some. Basically, this is exactly what you need to do step by step if you want to follow this gist. And in fact, we can. I'll send this out to the um, to the chat right now. So if you if it's easier for you to follow along here, um, there it is. And this just makes sure that you have the the, um, the current versions of Flux and uh, the kind cluster project, uh, the Kubernetes SIG kind um, projects. So you can run a cluster locally. Um, make sure that you just have the current versions. Um, and this is for a Mac. So if you're you know if you're um, not using Homebrew, if you're not on a Mac, you know just install them however uh, you need to. I think given if that's the case, you probably know what you're doing. So um, the second thing that you need, and you can see this from, if you just go to fluxcd.io uh, or the Flux, web, the Flux website, um, and you look at the installation instructions, you'll get this information, these first few steps. Um, but this just helps you so you don't have to go there right now. Um, just one thing you do need, and this is important to note, is you need a personal access token when using 
the flux bootstrap command locally. Um, if you're, I'm going to do this on GitHub, but you can use GitLab, um, plain Git, uh, other, other, um, other sources as well. Uh, I'm using GitHub because I find it to be easiest and it's very um, commonly used. So, and you can make a free account. So follow along if you would like. What you need is a, a personal access token um, so that the flux bootstrap command can create a cluster for you, or excuse me, yeah, uh, sorry, create a git repo, the repository for you. Um, uh, it can also, it will also properly use to set up deploy keys and make sure that those deploy keys are in the cluster properly. It will not send your personal access token anywhere besides your current session. Uh, it will not send that to your cluster. You don't have to worry about um, the security implications there. It was really only to help make it convenient for you to do those things. You don't have to use Flux Bootstrap either in order to use Flux. Um, so for the hyper security minded folks, just keep that in mind. Um, don't be scared when I say there's a personal access token. It, it really just helps with the things that you'll see. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. So I've already exported my token. I've created this cluster. I'm just going to show you. <sighs> That, um, that the character count should be 40. Yep, that's that's what the personal access tokens for GitHub are. And uh, I've already created the cluster to save you 30 seconds. So now what I'm gonna do just to keep it very simple is I'm going to run this flux bootstrap command and I'll explain it to you as I do while it's running, I mean. Uh, the output from flux bootstrap does explain it as well. Um, but in short, I'm setting an inter, I'm setting an interval for 10 seconds, which you don't want to do probably for anything other than demos. This just makes it so that any changes that I make, um, if I push it, it will be um, uh, it will be under 10 seconds, and half the time it will be under, and half the time it will be uh, half of that. <laughs> so uh, it makes it easy for demo. Normally, you may want to set this to 10 minutes, or, or really whatever whatever works for your um, for your setup. Um, I think I believe it's one minute by default. Um, I'm setting this. Um, I'm giving it information about a a uh, a GitHub repo. I, I want it to be under my username, which is this. I want it to be personal, um, which which uh, um, you know, I, it's I I want I don't want this to be um, in uh, shared or, or in a in a public repo. Um, and I want this to be the repository name, Flux for Helm users. So I am specifying branch, um, which is main. It could be something else if you if you preferred. And I'm specifying the path. This is an important one. I'm specifying the path um, that the source controller is going to be looking at within my Git repository for where the manifests are that it wants to reconcile into the cluster automatically. So that when I make any changes within that directory, um, it will automatically pick those up. I'm saying inside of a path called clusters dev, your repo can be structured in many ways. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're, that Pinky and I are going to be covering on um, the 17th, as Stacey mentioned at the beginning of this. Uh, and there's just, there's really so much you can talk about there. So I'm just keeping it quite simple. You could imagine having a path uh, for your dev cluster that looks here and a path for clusters stage, clusters prod. You can, um, you can set it up in various ways. And I, I'll just uh, save that one for the other talk. So Scott, can I direct you for a quick yes. question? Uh, when you're yes. on the Flux Bootstrap, it takes the cube context uh, of your current cluster and set up all the necessary pieces on the cluster dev scope? Correct. Great. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Was that a question from the chat? It was, yeah. OK, thank you. Easy. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you got it, yeah. Um, that's exactly it. And you, there are many, if you want to take a look at um, Flux Bootstrap help, there's just, there are really quite a lot of options you can give in terms of your context, I mean, including context and so on. Um, things that you may be familiar with from using Kube Control. Um, yeah, quite, quite a bit of options, but the, but the default ones are that, yes. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show you that this page not found 
uh, is because I deleted my demo repo before, uh, before this, but the flux bootstrap command created it again. Uh, it created it again, it set up um, the, uh, the clusters dev uh, path, which, me, which I had mentioned is where we specified um, that we want uh, flux manifests to be added. And I wanted to show you what it commits real quick. Um, uh, excuse me. Yeah, by, by showing you <laughs> the actual commits itself. So, so there's, there's two, thing that, two things that it commits. Um, the first commit is the component manifest. This is everything required to run Flux. You really, this is just quite a large file, right? It's 5,000 lines. Um, you really only want to look at this if you want to use this to upgrade Flux, which people do. And um, this is also here to demystify the process. Um, bootstrap, yes, of course, you need something to bootstrap within the cluster in order for Flux to even know where to look for these manifests, but it includes its own manifests. So, um, so once you've set this up, it is self-running at this point. Um, for example, if you were to create another cluster, uh, you could bootstrap that other cluster with this source. Um, say if you had a multi-cluster setup and you wanted to set up like that, uh, and it would continue to just read exactly what you had. And if you wanted to, if Flux comes out with a new version, or you want to use a bot to check, check on updates, which some folks do, um, and automatically update your, your Git or open a PR when, when Flux has a new version, et cetera, you can do that kind of thing. And you don't have to really interact with the system directly any longer. Um, Flux will update itself. So the second, uh, the second is I will show you because it's quite smaller. It's not 5,000 lines, it's just a few lines here. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a sync YAML, which is basically the, the, the Flux source controller custom resources that um, that you need to to tell the flux source controller, hey, look in this, look in that directory, uh, and then the customization um, resource that says, hey, uh, um, yes, I want to go ahead and sync whatever manifest you put in, there. and and that's what that controller will do, like I had mentioned before. And then there's just a customization file because that's how customization knows um, where to look. Uh, you actually don't need this customization.yaml file when you're you making your own manifests. This is just here, again, to demystify the process because Flux Customize Controller will automatically create one of these on the fly if you don't have one. Um, it allows you to make one so that you can use more advanced customized uh, functionality, but we're not doing that right now. And you don't need to, but, uh, but there are cases where you might want to. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, time check here. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and and clone the this this newly created repo. Wait a second. Well, I'm already there. I'm going to delete this repo locally because I had just done this before the demo, um, and I want to show you how you don't need this. Uh, you don't need anything um, local uh, to do what we've done so far. I'm just in my home directory. And none of the none of the the flux bootstrap command or any of this stuff needs to be done from any specific directory. Um, it's uh, it's standalone and it's um, idempotent. So I'm just going to go ahead and clone this again. Uh, or I guess I'm already here, so I'll go ahead and clone this again, and I'll cd into that directory, and then you can see those files that I just mentioned are are here. Okay, so as a, in order to show you how you can move from a traditional Helm release, or let's say just using the CLI, to a GitOps Helm release using the Helm uh, controller, I'm going to go ahead and do a normal Helm release using the CLI first, then convert it. Uh, let me just check the chat to see if there's any. OK, great. Yep. OK, so that was the question from before. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I have this repo already. So I've got pod info already locally. Um, I only need that because I'm using the Helm CLI. Uh, I wouldn't even need this locally if we weren't going to do the, uh, a, a normal uh, Helm install first using the CLI and then convert it. 
um, Flux uh, takes care of all of that for you. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at, I'm going to use the, uh, the Helm show values command in order to, um, to give you, to show some of the options, because we're going to, we're going to set some options to make it a little bit more fun, to make it feel more like a real example and not just a, a, a silly demo example. So I'm going to Helm show values and I'm just going to, I think I only want the first 20 lines or 18 lines or something, if I'm right about that. Yes. Okay. So, so these are, this is the very top of the file. And um, here are some of the options. So um, I am going to want to set replica count to two for fun. Um, and I'll set the log level um, to debug. And then I'll set a nested um, value just so you can see it when this goes into the actual custom resource. Uh, to the UI color, UI, and then color. I'm just going to make it another color. So, so I'm going to use the Helm upgrade install command, um, which Helm users will know will always in will always upgrade an existing release or install one if it doesn't exist. It doesn't, but I'll just use it. Or it doesn't exist now, but I'll just use it. So I'll I'll go ahead and do that into my kind cluster. So it should take just a second. Uh, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and port forward just to kind of, just for fun to show how, oops, no, to show how this is, is working. Uh, oh, my mistake. I missed a zero to 98. Nine zero, I think, is what the port forwarding was. Oh, nine eight nine eight. Okay, you got to copy and paste the right things in a demo. Okay, so uh, so now we've got this running with the red background that I had set. Okay, not super exciting uh, at this point. This is just using Helm, but it is exciting for people who don't know about Helm. It's part of the magic of Helm. You can just deploy things without configuring a ton of YAML on your own. Uh, so let's go ahead and convert these uh, to um, declarative custom resources that Flux will understand. I'm going to first create a custom source or source controller, and um, that tells uh, Flux about the Helm repository. Um, I'm sorry, sorry. That tells Flux about how to get that source. Um, uh, and it's got the deploy key in order to find it properly, because I believe. Oh, wait, I didn't make this private. Oh, I did. Yeah, so this is a private repo. This I kept it private as an example to show you that you can do this. You don't have to. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to um, uh, tell Flux about um, the Helm information. So first, I'll, I'll use this handy Flux command to create a source. Uh, just so you know, just to be clear, you do not have to use the Flux CLI. This is just for convenience. Um, and I'm and I'm output I'm, I'm I'm setting the export flag to output this into a file that we'll look at before we put it anywhere. It's just setting this locally here. So, so um, I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to cat this or vim into this to show you what it looks like. And and there is the Helm repository. This is a source. This is still considered a source for your Helm chart. Um, we already have the Git repo, so we just need the Helm repository where, where so that the uh, the Helm controller knows where to pull from. Um, this could also have been a Git bucket. Uh, excuse me, a a um, uh, a S three compatible um, storage bucket, and very soon um, an OCI uh, registry. But for now, it's a Git. It's a Helm repo. So um, that's what you see. And then we're going to create a Helm release. Um, for Just so that we can do this properly, I'm going to go ahead and get, I'm going to use Helm get values to get the values that we had already set and spit that YAML out into, um, I can show you, just a file called my values. Um, and that's exactly what we had set in the Helm release. I'm showing you that because I want to show you how the flux create Helm release command can 
use those values in order to populate the values already into the custom resource that Flux understands for Helm release. So I'm using the export command again. I'm gonna output it to a file and show you again before we commit this and push it and show you anything happening. So um, this is really just uh, um, a version of, of how, um, excuse me, uh, this, it's really the same kinds of options that you can use with the Helm install or Helm upgrade commands, um, but instead it can um, either bootstrap that directly into your repo, which we're not doing, or stick that into a file, which we are doing, because I want to show you how this works with GitOps. So this is what that looks like, um, the Helm release object itself. And you can see how our values were automatically populated using that values um, uh, flag. Let me just get a quick check on the comments. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions. I didn't want to stop you in the middle. Yeah, of yeah. Uh, that's okay. I just want to look at them real fast before. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to briefly know how the Flux Bootstrapper stores a deleted Helm-based application resource file. Aha! Is the Helm resource file um, originally cached? Um, so, so I... I'm actually going to fly through this demo and show you that very thing. It's it's not that the um, Helm resource file is cached. If you if by that you mean the the um, the secrets files inside of your cluster that you're used to as a, a Helm CLI operator, human operator, um, the source of truth. Um, if you delete an actual Helm release itself, um, is uh, is stored in Git at this point. So if you um, if you delete the Helm release from your cluster, that reconciliation will happen again. It will just start at revision one again because the, the Helm revision information is stored in your cluster. And that's the same as if you were to scale up or create new cluster, sorry, to, to scale up with new clusters or in a disaster recovery scenario. I, if that's what you were asking. Um, yeah. So uh, if not, let me know. But OK. And then the second one is, so in this example, the Helm repository is in namespace, is in namespaces in default. Uh, I assume if you don't use that argument, the repo will be available for all the clusters, for all the cluster. Um, yes and no. Uh, you, could, we can, you can achieve that by putting um, the Helm repo in the Flux system namespace. Um, and configuring your, um, you can actually use a target namespace so that your releases and your repo information live in one central place. And it's actual, um, the, the namespace where it deploys the resources for that Helm release will be elsewhere. The downside of that is that your Helm tools uh, won't automatically work because um, it, they're expecting that Helm release information to be, to be where it normally is. So that is a scenario that you use only for things like um, uh, if you want um, a much, for example, to manage Helm releases on a cluster that's totally separate from where you're even running your custom resources so that it can be very, very light. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of options like that, but no, normally, normally no, um, it's scoped to namespace. I hope that that helps, uh, Benicius. Yeah, if I pronounced your name right, okay. So, um, so just to uh, run through this a little bit faster, um, I'm not gonna remove the values YAML right now because there's no real point, but I, I am going to go ahead and show you what we got. We've got, the, we've got those two files that we made that we looked at. We're going to go ahead and add them. Um, and I'm going to, you know, so you see what's gonna be added. I'm gonna get commit. Um, uh, so I'm configuring pod, the pod info Helm repo source and release. Oops, I should probably spell get commit correctly. There we go. And then I'll just do a get push. So now we can um, we can check out some magic. Uh, you'll see that in that now there's three uh, commits because I pushed that commit. 
And um, if I do a Helm LS, first of all, we'll see that there's two revisions now um, because uh, the next revision was pushed when Flux took over the release. And you can tell that by looking at the, um, I'll just take a look at the, the top for you so you can see it in context. Um, these, uh, these, these, and these labels are added to show that the Flux Helm controller is, is, is taking over that release. Um, so that's why it had to have a new revision there. And that helps you see what's going on. Uh, you can also, you can also um, do a, uh, a flux get HR for the Helm release. And you can see that um, that Helm release is, is a, a reconciliation succeeded and it's not suspended, it's still running. So I'm gonna quickly just show you what it means to um, like what it looks like to change something to your Helm release without having to use the Helm CLI anymore. You could actually, in this case, you can toss that out. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Not that you, not that you want to, but now I'm going to get add. Uh, just change that. Well, ignore the line, but the line ending, but change that color from red to blue. Um, for now. I'm going to say blue background or something, and then I'll do a um, get push. And then if I do if I, if I watch this, it should um, change to uh, revision three in a second. There we go. Um, I should be able to uh, I should be able to um, see the, the helm diff, use the helm diff plugin still if you would like, you know, just to give you a sense of how that all works together. Um, and you can see it in real life by port forwarding again. Um, I'll uh, oh, change to blue. Lovely, right? Okay. So very, very exciting. That's all happened through GitOps, not through any, any um, Helm commands except for the diff plugin that I showed you just so you can see that you can use your, your uh, same tools. So um, I'm going to show you quickly that you can pause and resume. Um, it's quite, how do we do that on time? Hmm. Well, I just want to check in with you, Stacy. Uh, I could spend an extra few minutes to show a few extra things, but I don't have to. I could just describe them briefly in a moment so people know, and then you can follow along at home with this just, what do you think is best? Yeah, I mean, how many minutes do you think you're going to be? We're at the top of the hour now, so if it's going to be like two more minutes, then sure. I would say two or three. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so in short, here's how you do. Um, I gotta get better at doing this quickly. Uh, here's how you do um, suspending. So, so there's a command to help you with this. All it really does is it sets an annotation in your uh, in your um, Helm release. So you can actually use the flux suspend command for any flux object that does reconciliation. So that's that's required for reconciliation. So I'll go back up to. Um, getting the Helm release using the flux command. And you can see now that it's suspended is true. And this is important because I'm going to show you how you can use the Helm tool still. Like say if it were an incident management um, situation and you wanted to like, use your normal tools, um, you could do a Helm rollback to release two. Uh, you could see that it's going to switch back to, um, oops. There we go. It's going to switch back to red because we did a Helm rollback, right, with our change, um, and um, and it's not going to automatic while you're doing your incident management. It's not automatically going to overwrite what you did in the cluster because you're making an imperative command now, um, just as if you did a kube control edit or something like that and made a change. And this shows you how um, if I do resume, uh, Flux will automatically. I think I have it set in 10 seconds, but Flux will, um, will automatically uh, overwrite whatever someone, in this case, it was me, changed within the cluster imperatively based on what was in Git. So I can do that um, 
get Helm release. It's not suspended any longer, and we can um, we can port forward again and see that that got overwritten um, back to oh yeah, back to blue, right? Yeah. So cool, great. Um, that kind of shows us cool stuff. Now um, we're going to do something crazy. We're going to clean up, right? We're going to clean up by deleting the cluster. All right, this is not actually where the demo ends. There's one more little thing. I'm going to show you what uh, disaster recovery looks like. So we have no cluster. There's nothing here. I'm going to create a brand new one without flux. It'll take about 30 seconds. And then this, what, what's going to happen is we're simulating right now what would happen in a disaster recovery. So at the end of my demo, I can delete my repo because I don't need it anymore, right? But, but before I delete that, I want to show you that I still have the Git repo, uh, the, the code with the Helm releases in it, uh, the Helm repo information and the Helm release information. And all we really have to do again is go back up to that bootstrap command, run that again, and it will bring back my releases exactly as they were. Um, and this is uh, in itself pretty impressive. Um, but it's even more impressive if you think about if you had, instead of just one demo app with a few values, if you had hundreds of applications or thousands across various namespaces across multiple clusters, you can see how disaster recovery um, would really would really work here. So I'll just wait for customization to reconcile. Um, and I'm pretty good. I'm pretty close to my my estimate. It's four minutes after now. Uh, okay, components are. I'm not sure what I did there. Components are healthy. So if I do the port forward again, uh, you'll see that I'm still here. It's handling the connection. If I check out the Helm release, it's back to revision one and it's restored my release. So that's it. Um, I don't see any more questions in chat, but if you do have more questions, you know, I'm around and thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. And thanks everybody for sticking around. And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and end it there. Reach out to us on Slack or uh, other methods like Twitter for Scott. I think he's R6BY on Twitter, right? Um, yeah, and uh, we'll we'll go ahead and close it out. Thanks a lot. Appreciate cool. it. Thanks.